In the rugged mountains of the American frontier, news spread quickly of the personal war between the Crow Nation and a single mountain man, known by many names including Jeremiah Johnson and his real name, John Johnston. The war began with the murder of his wife, the daughter of a flathead chief, and her unborn child. Quickly followed by Johnson's revenge against the warriors who killed her, and any other man from the Crow tribe he came across. The 1972 film, Jeremiah Johnson, is considered by many to be historical fiction. Just like the book it's based on. But since the story came from real interviews with men who knew Johnson, for this video we'll take it as it was written. It was in 1848 that the first news of Johnston's despoiling of the Crows spread through the West. Over vast territory where white men's campfires were few, far from the Absarokas or Crows' own lands, and indeed wherever they hunted or traded, Crow warriors' bodies, and only Crow warriors' bodies, were found mutilated in special fashion, not merely scalped, but cut beneath the ribs, and the livers removed. The general knowledge of Johnston's motives among the scattered inhabitants of that wilderness resulted only from an anonymous Indian's accidental spying out of a visit by Johnston to his bones of his wife and child. Naturally, the vendetta could not remain hidden. Within half a year, Johnston became the crow killer, or liver-eating Johnson. When Johnson did come to the post, Fort Laramie, to trade in 1851, he brought crow scalps and finery, and the furs he brought were of such quality that traders vied for their purchase. In return for these, he received powder and ball aplenty, so little flour or meal as to draw comment, and salt and sugar and coffee. The salt was the subject matter for an eerie joke. Do he salt them Injun livers? But the joke was told at a safe distance. When he rode out again, there were indeed crows where Johnson was heading, and he did not know where they were, and he was on a death trail. Men had come to know that the liver eater never rode without a purpose. Meanwhile, at every trading post, the crows were derided. Did the crows allow their women and even their girls to argue fiercely? Did they allow their children to romp through the council tent? Then surely just such a lack of discipline had left them vulnerable to their killer. Fort Alexander, the crow's trading post on the Yellowstone, was overrun by foes come to laugh at them. Sioux warriors stood in crow fighting men's path to draw their fingers across their abdomens and cry, contemptuously, Isantanka, big knife. Again and again the crows took up the challenge, in hand-to-hand -hand battle to the death, but in ever greater numbers they were beset by the laughing, sneering Sioux. Crow elders decried the wrong first done Johnson by young, thoughtless warriors. In their lust to count coups, they had not troubled themselves over what enmity their whole tribe might incur. But whatever the elders might think of original rights and wrongs, they must take action. Chief Big Robert, also known as Big Robber, called a council of war, and after some debate announced his decision. Johnson had already shown his skill in literally smelling out an attack. Let the Crow Council, then, make use of the intrepidity of the very best of Crow warriors, their willingness to face death in heroic service of their people. Let the Crow Council consider how best to multiply the chance that one warrior, at least, could reach the Crow Killer. Let a score of single warriors be sent on separate trails to take their single chances till one of them should prove shrewder or luckier than their prey. Let none of their braves return till the white killer was dead. Big Robert's mother it was who went among the braves, selecting, from among the fiercest and most agile, this one for his rashness, and that one for his cunning, another for his lightning speed, and yet another for endurance. Her black eyes snapping, she whispered to each she chose their people's demand that they give themselves unreservedly. Indeed, though some of those chosen sought their foe for years, there were none of them to return. 
Fortunately, perhaps, John Johnson never told how he destroyed such Crow warriors, one by one. And since during the years when he killed the first seventeen of them, he still kept himself pretty much alone, fellow mountain men observed his killing of only two. During the American Civil War, Johnson put aside his own feud, his reckoning with the twentieth Crow warrior, already twelve years on his trail. The nineteenth he had killed at Labonte's Creek, Wyoming, in 1863. In the battles of Newtonia, Missouri, sharpshooter John Johnston was found taking a vast harvest of Seminole and Cherokee scalps. Reprimanded sharply by Union officers, the crow killer gave up his booty and longed for his wilderness. When the war finally ended, his honorable discharge came through on September 23, 1865, Johnson headed north from Missouri toward winter, where he rejoined his friend Del Gue, who was trapping on the Little Medicine Bow River in Wyoming. He and Dell worked their trap lines incessantly and peaceably throughout the winter, with excellent luck. Their only unfriendly visitor was the twentieth and last of the crows long since marked to kill Johnson. Even that adventure was not in Johnson's usual heroic mold, for he was almost caught off guard, washing dishes. Bent over as he was, he could not be seen from the campsite, but as he worked away on the pan with cloth and sand, he sensed, smelled as he put it, a familiar foe. Johnson surprised the intruder with a hard kick and finished him with a bowie knife to the chest. Good God, said Dell. This an air number 20. Johnson nodded. On your trail for 10 years. Near 14, Johnson told him. The partners fell to discussing the crows. Even more admirable than crow hardihood, they agreed, was crow tenacity. For a warrior to spend so many years away from his family on such a death trail was marvelous indeed. The partner spoke of how many times he must surely have hidden near his village to spy upon his family and watch his children grow. They considered, too, how as one by one the others of the chosen twenty died, loneliness must have come upon him more and more. For three years now there had been no fellow tribesman to whom he could speak. He had grown accustomed, no doubt, to warding off for himself all physical hunger and cold, but the hunger and cold in his soul must have passed all bounds. It was Dell who said, I'm sure glad that's over. He stared bleakly at the brawny corpse before them and traced the slit in the abdomen with a dried weed. Even Johnson had no more fun to make of his partner's queasiness about eating livers. Quietly, he cut the twentieth notch in the rosewood handle of his bowie knife. What was left out of the story was the names of these twenty warriors. And perhaps more importantly, what happened to their remains after they died? According to the 1935 book, The Crow Indians, there were two main forms of disposal, either in the fork of a tree or on a scaffold of four forked poles. The kin packed the corpse on his horse and went to bury him. Whether on a tree, or in the rocks, or on top of a hill, they laid him down. Having buried him, his kin remained there and cried. If subsequently they killed a young man of the same hostile tribe, they were even. The families of these men never got their revenge against Johnson. But I hope they could at least take comfort knowing their sons, brothers, and fathers fell in battle against a great warrior. And in the end, Johnson made peace with the Crow tribe, which will be the subject of another video. Thank you for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to this channel for new videos every week or two, and see the description below for a list of books, films, and online resources featured in this video.